Hi everybody, welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. My name is Jared. In this video, I wanna talk about a recent video that I made where we were reading out of The Government of God by John Taylor. And in that book, uh, he had an excerpt from A Warning Voice by Parley P. Pratt. And we were reading about all the changes that are gonna take place to the earth. That essentially, the earth is gonna become, uh, it sounds like, like a plain. Rather than having really tall mountains and deep valleys, you know, the valleys are going to be exalted, the mountains are going to be made low, and everything's going to be uh, leveled. And uh, a lot of people don't like that. And, you know, in one way, I don't either, because I do enjoy the mountains. I do enjoy, um, you know, all the diversity that we see within the land and in geography. I like canyons and valleys and stuff like that. But uh, the fact remains that it does seem that the earth is going to become like a plain. And furthermore, those places that are desolate, where uh, it's harder for life to grow and thrive, such as deserts, uh, that's going to be no more. Uh, <clears throat> Everywhere is going to become fruitful and fertile, and it's going to become a paradisiacal world. So, you know, and I'm also, I'm a big fan of the desert. I, I lived in Phoenix and I really liked it there. I, there's a certain beauty to the desert and a certain aesthetic that I really like. But we're not going to have those things anymore. And so someone in uh, the comments for that video brought up, well, you know, what about these animals that are designed specifically to live in the desert or in the Arctic or uh, w whatever their environment is? They're designed for that environment, which will no longer be around during the millennium. So I wanted to address that. And uh, really, it doesn't come so much from John Taylor or Parley P. Pratt. It goes all the way back to Isaiah, if you think about it. You'll remember that Isaiah said that animal life is going to change during the millennium, that the lion is going to eat straw like the ox, uh, which is a very curious thing because as of right now, lions and other predators, they are not ruminants. You and I are not ruminants. Ruminants are animals that eat grass and they have this particular type of digestive system where... Um, Essentially, what they do is they eat grass. It goes into one of the four chambers of their stomach called the rumen. And in the rumen, what's actually happening is the cow is like feeding the microorganisms, the bacteria, fungi, and protozoa that live in their rumen. Uh, there's a fermentation process that goes on and uh, the, the food is broken down and the cow absorbs some of that. Uh, but the cow also... Uh, eats or digests the, the microorganisms themselves. And so that's how the digestive system, in a nutshell, it's very simplified, that's how the digestive system of a, a cow works, for example. And uh, as far as I know, lions and cheetahs and bears, <coughs> they don't have a rumen. I don't know how many stomachs they have. Maybe there's, there's just one like us. I don't know. But um, they're not designed... Uh, to eat grass, are they? But Isaiah says that the lion is going to eat straw like the ox. And so uh, I would assume that, you know, if they're going to be, if they're going to have the same uh, diet as cows and other herbivores, goats, that they'd probably have to have the same digestive system and that would have to change. And that would be a really, really big change, wouldn't it? Um I'll be interested to see how that works. Uh, furthermore, you know, predators have sharp teeth and the sharp teeth is designed to help them tear away flesh from a carcass and, um, you know, cut it up and then digest it. So will they need that anymore? I don't know. I don't think so. It could be that lions and other predators are going to look much different than what they, than the way that they appear now. Maybe they'll look somewhat similar, but maybe they'll almost look like a brand new creature. I have no idea. I'm just going to keep an open mind. But the fact remains is that they're not going to eat meat anymore. Nobody is. Not even us. Uh, we we learned that from Parley P. Pratt as well as Bruce R. McConkie, uh, as well as Isaiah, that, uh, that it's just it's not going to be like that anymore. Um, <clears throat> also, we have this curious statement by... Isaiah that the serpent is going to eat dust. It's 
it's going to eat the dust of the ground. And I don't know if that's literal, but maybe there's going to be some new type of uh, digestion for, for snakes and other animals like that. Uh, maybe there's going to be a way to digest the, the dust and rocks and dirt and sand of, of the earth. Who knows? Who knows what the limit is? But there's going to be some pretty fundamental changes. You think about the fact that since there's not going to be more, any more eating of meat uh, by, by any animal or, or by people, you think about prey and how they currently operate. For example, porcupines. Uh, they have a defense mechanism called quills to discourage potential predators from attacking them because if they do, uh, they're going to get a quill in the face or somewhere else and it's going to stick into them and it, and it hurts. You know, you have skunks that, well, I don't need to tell you about skunks. They spray a nasty smell to discourage predators from chasing after them. Uh, you have different animals that have camouflage patterns, and that's so that they're less visible to potential predators. Um, you also have animals that have shells like turtles and snails and so on and so forth designed to prevent a predator from uh, getting to their, you know, their uh, flesh and vital organs and so forth. So I could see a lot of things changing. And if they do change, if we end up having turtles that don't have shells, that may sound sad, but maybe they'll turn out to look even better than they do right now. Uh, maybe it's just everything's going to be different and we're still going to enjoy it. It's just going to be, they're just going to be different. These, these things, these aspects of their physiology that are necessary in a telestial fallen world may not be necessary anymore in a terrestrial paradisiacal world, and therefore their bodies will change and maybe we'll be pleased with the result. I don't know. But there's going to be really big changes. Uh, not just that, but the fact that us and animals are not going to have blood anymore, right? We're not going to have blood. So does that mean that we're not going to have arteries and veins anymore? Is blood going to be replaced by some other fluid? Um, I don't know. I don't know how it's going to work, but that's a pretty fundamental change. Um, there's a lot that's going to change. There's not going to be any more disease, and I'm really looking forward to that. No more disease, pain, no more death as we know it. Um, I assume uh, animals, just like us, will live to their full age, whatever that is for them. Uh, for us, it's 100 years of age. And at that point, you die, but you die in the sense that you're changed in the twinkling of an eye from this mortal, quickened state into a resurrected, immortal state. So if there's all these different changes to animals, digestive systems and blood and age and disease and all this stuff, I, I don't have a hard time believing that whatever they're adapted to right now, if you have a desert animal, that they'll simply change along with everything else uh, to live in this new world that we're going to find ourselves in. There's going to be a lot of change. A lot. Um, it's going to be incredible. It's going to be wonderful. So, um, and it makes sense because when you think about it, food, for example, it seems that food is not just it's not just like something that we literally physically do. We do literally eat food, but it seems to be symbolic of something much deeper. When you read the scriptures, uh, for example, in, uh, I think it's in second Nephi, he talks about feasting upon the word of God, that we should feast upon the word of God. Um, because when we learn, uh, the gospel, when we study it, when we live it, when we live it, it's as though we are eating, right? When we eat, we, we take something that has nutrients and uh, we put it into ourselves and then we break it down. <laughs> we take it into ourselves and then some of it becomes a part of us. It literally becomes a part of us. That's how, how this whole thing works. Likewise, when we live the gospel and we, you know, study the scriptures, we study the words of the prophets, we study the word of God. 
we break it down in our minds into ways that we can understand. And it's a process that takes time, but we learn little by little. And we take those and in incorporate that into ourselves, or at least that's the idea. If you're going to church and you're not actually learning, if you're not trying to change, if you're not living the commandments for the right reasons or living the commandments at all, uh, it's like sitting at a dinner table with delicious food and you're not eating. You're, you're just starving. Um, that which will give you life uh, is not giving you life because you're not eating it. So, um, so we're in this, um, ever since the fall, we've been living in this telestial condition, as it's called. We're, it's not a telestial glory. The glory is for when we're resurrected and those that obtain um, the telestial glory, they'll live in a much better place than where we live right now. Joseph Smith said that if we were permitted to see it, the telestial glory, you would kill yourself to get there because that's how good it is. So just imagine how much better the terrestrial world or the terrestrial glory is and the celestial glory. So we're not in a telestial glory. We're in a telestial condition. And the way that it works during this phase uh, for these 6,000 years is uh, it's the law of the jungle. It's all about the natural man. The natural man is designed to compete for resources and to protect itself, you know, and uh, not really care about others, just self-preservation, reproduction, all the things that, you know, our animal self wants to do and that we see in the animal kingdom. And so the natural man uh, doesn't care about your feelings. It doesn't care about, um, you know, these higher principles like sacrifice and uh, loving one another and, you know, giving of yourself to help somebody else out. Um, there is a natural man version of that, but it's not because it's out of the kindness of their heart. They may do something nice for you because uh, they're expecting something nice back. It's not because they're living a higher law. It's because uh, they're trying to manipulate the situation. Oh, I'll scratch your back and then you'll scratch my back rather than just scratching your back because it's a nice thing to do because you love that person and you want to relieve, uh, you know, what they're going through. And so we're, we're in this process of being in a fallen condition and we're consuming the, the telestial experience. You and I are both experiencing pain and suffering and grief and heartache and uh, all these different things. And that's something that we are supposed to consume and experience. We're making that a part of us. It's for our experience. And so you could say it's kind of like eating meat. When you eat meat, you have to kill another uh, organism to, to consume their flesh. You know, it's a very primal, very like lower level way of living, but it can sustain you. And uh, it's necessary for us to experience this telestial condition. And we'll take those memories and experiences with us into the eternities. And we, we will know for ourselves uh, just how bad uh, things can be. You know, there, there's this little place, this bubble that where God allows us to experience these horrible things. But it's so that we can have that experience and be able to distinguish be, between good and evil and suffering and not suffering and uh, health and sickness and, you know, all those things. So um, we're eating meat right now, which causes suffering or it, it robs another form of life of its life. Um, and uh, that's just how things are right now. <coughs> And it's designed to be that way. But when we move into the millennium, uh, we're no longer going to be in a telestial condition. We're going to be in a terrestrial condition, which is how this world started out with Adam and Eve uh, being in the Garden of Eden. It was a terrestrial world. And, um, and so we're no longer, things are not going to operate the way that they did for the last 6,000 years. Uh, those that are wicked, those that you know, chronically, perpetually uh, pattern their life after the telestial style, they're going to be removed. 
the wicked are going to be removed from the earth. They're not going to move on into the, um, the millennium in this terrestrial condition world. And so during this time, the 7,000 years, we're, we're moving to a completely different level, um, both physically and spiritually. There is going to be much more that we learn and do during the millennium. And like I said, I think that's why President Nelson keeps talking about living living in a higher, holier way. Uh, I did a video about that, and we discovered that when that phrase has been used in the past, in general conference, it's used um, in the context of moving from one dispensation to another. Uh, like they've used that phrase uh, to describe the time of Christ, how Christ brought um, the higher teachings and taught his disciples to live in a higher, holier way. So we're going to be doing the same thing in the millennium. Bruce R. McConkie said that undoubtedly there's going to be new doctrines that we learn. We know that there's going to be additional scripture, right? We're going to have scripture from the 10 lost tribes. We're going to have the uh, sealed portion of the Book of Mormon, the Book of Enoch, and, and probably many other writings and learn things that we didn't know. And not only that, but have new things revealed during the millennium. So everything's going to be at a higher level. And so when we're talking about eating food uh, and that being a symbol of uh, our earthly experience, well, uh, that would seem, it would seem that that would need to change too. You know, we're no longer eating animals. Uh, we're not living in this lower, in this lower condition. We're moving to something higher. And yes, uh, plants do have life, and so you're still taking the life of a plant. But, um, you know, we all have a less problem. <laughs> we have less uh, of an issue with that than we do with uh, killing animals, generally speaking, right? Because animals are more like us. Uh, they have eyes, they have blood, they have legs and limbs, and, and we can relate more to animals than I think than we can to plants. I, I don't know. I guess that's up to up for debate, but I think you know what I'm saying. And so um, that begs the question, well, no, it really doesn't. W once we move on from the millennium, uh, the earth is going to be celestialized, and it'll obtain its celestial glory. To my knowledge, there's no such thing as the earth living in a telestial or a celestial condition, like how we're in right currently in a telestial condition, not a telestial glory. The millennium will be a terrestrial condition, not a terrestrial glory. Well, I don't think that there's a celestial condition. Uh, the world just becomes celestialized and obtains its celestial glory. So at that point, once the world is celestialized, uh, the only ones that are able to live there are those that are uh, resurrected and have and obtained uh, the celestial, you know, celestial bodies. Uh, there's not going to be any mortality, any mortals, any quickened mortals or otherwise living on the celestial earth because it'll be a celestial glory. And at that point, we'll all be immortal and there's not going to be any need for eating at all. So we're not going to be eating meat. We're not going to be eating plants, fruits, vegetables, grains. We're not going to be eating that. You don't have to eat as an immortal. As to whether uh, resurrect, resurrected beings do eat, I don't know. We, we know that they can because Christ demonstrated that after he was resurrected. Uh, he ate fish and honey, right? It was fish and honey. I think that's what he ate, if I remember right. So... It seems that they can if they want to, but if they do, I, I don't know. I have no idea. We'll just have to wait and see if that's the case. It is curious, though, that if our resurrected bodies look the same as they do now, uh, so in other words, we know that resurrected bodies will not have blood, but it seems like on the outside, everything will look the same. Um we do know that that, and we covered this recently in a, in another video. That um, it, it was it was Joseph Fielding Smith that said this, that celestial, or sorry, that resurrected bodies. No, I think he was making a distinction between celestial, terrestrial, and celestial resurrected bodies. 
So at the very least, celestial resurrected bodies shine. They, they, I guess, produce light. Um, that's what Joseph Smith said, or Joseph Fielding Smith said in Doctrines of Salvation. So no blood shining. I don't know what else, but otherwise it seems like we would look the same. Uh, the Savior, uh, I guess, appeared as just a man because uh, people didn't... Uh, it's not like they're like, oh my gosh, this is an alien or it's some creature. He looked like a man. Uh, it's interesting to note, though, he didn't look the same, I guess. They didn't recognize him for some reason. Uh, that must be because he had a different appearance as a resurrected being. So that's something to think about. Maybe, you know, we'll still be us, but maybe our perfected celestial bodies will look substantially different than what we look like right now. I don't know. But what I was getting at was, uh, it seems that as a resurrected being, you still have teeth. You know, teeth are designed to, um, for you to uh, eat food. It's like the it's the first part of the di the digestive process is putting something in your mouth and chewing it and breaking it down. Uh, teeth are also used for speech, so maybe that's why we would continue to have teeth. You know, because. But, but that's another thing. We know that there's, you know, there's there's communication beyond just like speaking with your mouth and your vocal cords and your lungs um, that it seems <coughs> I'd have to find where where you find this. But I know I've heard different times that and feel free to feel free to put it in the comments below if you know where you can find this. But I want to say that you can you basically can just communicate uh, telepathically. At that point, you know, we, we do it all the time with Heavenly Father when we pray, like we pray out loud. It's good to pray out loud, but you don't have to pray out loud. Uh, he's able to uh, hear your thoughts and hear the prayers of your heart. You don't necessarily have to pray out loud. It's a good idea to pray out loud, and I would encourage you to do that. And church leaders encourage us to do, to do that. And I think the reason why is because uh, when you don't pray out loud, and you're just like thinking in your mind, your mind is a very uh, abstract place and, and things are always moving around and morphing and it's easy to get distracted. So when you actually speak what you're trying to communicate, it brings it out here into the real world. It gives it more structure. It, it's more like logical. It's like for, cause like me talking to you, I have to, structure things in a logical way so that you understand what I'm trying to say. Whereas in your mind, you can just like think things and, um, and it's, it's not that it's not logical, but it's just kind of like a cloud. And so when you speak, you like, you hone it down, uh, into like specific things. And in that way, you don't get sidetracked. You don't, you know, you know what I'm saying? So, um, as far as having, mouths, teeth, tongues, you know, as resurrected beings. I don't know if those are just going to be relics of uh, this part of our existence. I don't know. These are all things that we do not know. There's a lot of mysteries and there's a lot of things to think about. And eventually we will have those answers. But coming back full circle. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not I'm not too surprised about animals uh, no longer having a desert home or an arctic home i think they're just going to simply change along with all the other changes that are going to take place to their bodies and they're just going to be an animal of well of a higher version of themselves and i guess we'll see what that looks like it's going to be really interesting but uh that's all that i have for this one so if you haven't already please make sure to subscribe like this video if you liked it leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below also make sure to share it and I'll talk to you guys later.